And now we're live. Okay. Well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you guys live. It's Jeff from Home Renovision here, and today we are talking, we're talking, oh, it's kind of lousy, and we have to talk about some serious bad stuff. Disaster restoration, right? Uh, once again, Mother Nature has kicked a lot of people in the butt. We've had hurricanes in the last few weeks that have affected eastern Canada and Florida. And generally speaking, my expertise is not boots on the ground post-hurricane in the first 48 hours, right? I'm in the rebuilding business, but I do have a lot of experience dealing with catastrophic events. So we've had a flood here in Ottawa years ago where we had thousands of homes affected in the same 24 hours. So I do understand the logistics of not having enough manpower and organization around to make things go smoothly. And I understand the frustration of you guys, the homeowners, as you're dealing with well this. So what we're doing today is we're going to, we did a little, well, we did a community post, right, Chris? We asked them what you guys wanted to see. And everybody wants to talk about this restoration of the house, you know, steps, things to look out for, the potential dangers. I understand, you know, we've talked this before, but let's face it. Um, and until you're invested in the restoration process, no one really pays attention to the restoration process, right? I get it. So we're going to do it again today. We'll talk about the process. And then we're also going to bring on Jason. Um, he is a, an insurance adjuster. He's, he's a private guy. He's someone that you can hire to do consulting for you. He's boots on the ground. He was part of the disaster back in the Florida Panhandle. He works for the company. He's organized. It's a national organization. Okay, he's very legit. We're going to get him on the air. We're going to talk to him about what's going on down in the Fort Myers area in the Lee County. And we're going to talk about um, things that you might need to know. Okay. I'm Canadian. We do things different up here. I had a quick chat with him the other night, and it's very apparent. Um, just full disclosure, I don't know Jason. My brother, John, who lives in Florida, knew Jason. And he said, hey, he might be a great guy to have on the show and shed some light. So that's what we're doing. We're all going to learn this together. All right. We're going to see what the hell's going on down there and, and hopefully provide you some information that might be valuable so that you can help navigate your storm situation, present, past, and future. All right. So. I don't know. Maybe this will be relevant to the folks that are living out in Texas who suffered a year and a half ago. We are going to jump all into that. Let's just say a quick hello to all of our friends and family in the chat. Yes, Yinzer House <laughs> from Pittsburgh. I finally got that right. Good to see you again. Existential Pain is here. Robert, of course you're here. You're a good man. Appreciate it. Um, we are also going to jump into some Q&A after we're done talking with Jason, okay? So if you've got specific questions, uh, I'm happy to help. We'll try to stay focused on the storm, but not everybody's affected by it. So if you got a question outside of the scope of our first initial conversation, that's cool. We're here to help regardless. Okay. All right. Look at all of this. Um, Eric, one thing I can, can I just get the comment section only brought up? Is that possible? Yeah. I'm going to uh, pop that out as soon as we... Uh... Fair enough. Okay. I wasn't sure if we could do it. <laughs> we are working with the StreamYard service tonight, guys, for the first time. And it gives us the ability to bring somebody on and go split screen and do all these wonderful things. Yes, we're getting better every day. And I'm getting half blind, so I need to be able to blow this up on the big TV next to me so I can read properly. But other than that, we are good to go. So let's just let's just jump right in, um, bring Jason up, and we will have a quick little conversation. All right, here we are. Welcome, Jason. Jason, maybe do us all a favor because... I don't know you very well, so why don't you introduce yourself for the folks at home so they know who you are, what are your credentials, and what is it that you're doing in Florida right now? Right on. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me on here. I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of this information with everybody. Um, again, my name is Jason Pruitt. I'm a regional director with Altieri Insurance Consultants. We're a public adjusting firm based, uh, corporately based out of Tampa, Florida. Uh, a little bit about myself is I was a uh, firefighter for 14, 15 years. Um, from paramedic, promoted up to a rescue lieutenant. Uh, from then, obviously, we had a lot of side jobs. So one of those side jobs ended up being an insurance adjuster. So mm -hmm. I worked insurance carrier for about six or seven years. I was there uh, an independent adjuster. So I worked for a TPA, which is a third party administrator who then gets claims sub to them from the carrier. So if an insurance claim is filed, it goes to the TPA. The TPA subs it to the independent adjuster, which was me. So I was the eyes and the ears and the face of the insurance company during insurance claims. Um, it ended up being where I was going out writing my own estimates because every I worked for three TPAs and about 25 to 27 different insurance companies. 
Every right. single insurance company had a different set of guidelines that they wanted to pay off of. So in doing that, any, any different carrier had to bring my notebook out, see what their guidelines were, and that's how I paid that claim. So okay, once well, let's I hold up there for a second because I don't want to get everybody lost in the soup here. Sure. That's really interesting information. I remember my experience was um, I was working in the insurance industry. I was in restoration, uh, disaster response, okay? And you can imagine um, we're all home one night doing nothing, and a huge storm whipped through town. We got 100 millimeters. What is that in inches? I don't know, a foot, maybe about a foot of rain in, in just a couple of hours. And our entire septic system for a city of a million people was overwhelmed. Four inches. Well, it's a hell of a lot of rain when it all goes into one pipe. <laughs> I can't do math on the fly. Please. The point is, is there was a, way too much rain for our, our, our drain system from the roads to carry. And it backed mm -hmm. up into the sewage. It backed up in everybody's basement. And so within five minutes, we had thousands of calls flooding the office. And I remember I went down to the office and all, the fax machine was just printing off like crazy. Every insurance company in the country who had cl claims in Ottawa, they were just sending out a fax going, just approve anything under 40,000, approve anything under 60,000. And they were work like that off the fly. They weren't even asking questions. No one wanted paperwork. They were just going to write checks. Does it work like that down where you were? Is that what you're talking about with the TPA? Or did they all have restrictions on how you were allowed to serve the customer? So where I worked, there were two types of adjusters. There was a desk, or sorry, there was a full adjust and there was a task adjust. So if you were a task adjuster, you were only writing an estimate and taking pictures and sending it to the examiner. And then they're the ones making the determination. I was on a full adjust. So I would have the, the claim cradle to grave. I did the uh, negotiation with the mitigation company. I do the adjustment process and I had an authority. Uh, my authority was very minimum. It was like 14,000. So anything over that, I had to go to the next level. So that's, wow. that's kind okay. of, so let's, let's talk okay. about that. 14,000 bucks. That doesn't go very far, does it? No, no it doesn't. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to say, um, because we're going to have Canadian viewers here as well. Mm -hmm. And, and my experience in Canadian insurance is that when you have a disaster, you call the insurance company, the adjuster comes out, their job is to help make you whole. Sure. And to manage yeah. your expectation about what the right. process for rebuilding is, generally complete restoration. They work with a one-year guideline. And so most folks aren't excited about that. But in a lot of situations, having that year is necessary because of the shortage of trades, materials, management, getting the proper paperwork together, all that, right? Yeah, it takes time. Is it is it a similar thing in the States do, or or? Are, do you, does everybody have the opportunity to become whole or does it depend on the policy? Break me down how your insurance system actually identifies who's a victim, who's a, who's a top tier client. Give me a little bit of information about that. When I was on the insurance side, um, we didn't really necessarily have top tier clients. You had um, uh, claim, claim dollar, I guess, tier. So, you know, if you had a claim that came in and the, the information they gave, they're projecting it to be five to 10,000. Well, they're going to send, you know, a certain group of people there that could handle it. If it's uh, 10,000 to 25,000, they're going to send a different group based on your qualifications. If it was a large loss, hundred thousand dollars or more, they're going to send a different type of adjuster because they're going to have a little bit different authority. They're going to have more experience and they're going to be able to, to more properly adjust the claim than a newer guy who's able to handle those smaller losses. Okay. I get it. All right. So, it, 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 okay. All right. Let's, let's ask another question here. I want to, I want to go through my list because I came a little prepared. Sure. Not too prepared, but a little bit. Um, we have some people, they want to know what is the difference between wind damage flooding, I'm sorry, wind damage and flooding in the eyes of insurance company. Okay. Especially, so let's talk about this because Fort Myers, it was windy as all get out, and that's what caused the flooding. Right. Or do they blame the rain? And does every insurance policy cover both? How does that work down there? Okay, so how it works is you have flood and you have wind. So FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, they're the ones that insure you for your flood damage. Um, okay. And the reason for that is because there's not really, there's a big loss in flood when the domestic carriers are handling those things. So right. what they did is FEMA kind of took it over. So now the FEMA is paying you uh, for, for your flood claims. So essentially, if the water comes from the ground up, that's going to be considered flood. Now, if you're having water in your house from the top down, whether it be from the roof, a wind created opening, that's going to be your uh, 
typically roof damage with ensuing water damage because it's coming okay. from the top down. So how do they define storm surge? Uh, storm surge is going to be flood because that's that's cut water coming in. It's coming from the ground, moving up gotcha. into the okay. crust. It's going to be flood. All right. And so then now we've got to distinguish between FEMA and private insurance companies. Yes. Does FEMA have a mandate to make you whole or do, do people need an, um, an advocate to deal with them as well? Um, it's always nice to have your own adjuster representing you, pointing out, you know, all the damages uh, because, you know, it is in the policy. It's, it's a condition for you to prove your claim to the insurance company. Now, with FEMA, uh, compared to the, the private carriers, uh, FEMA typically will pay um, a, a little bit more on their flood because they, they have very specific guidelines on how they pay. There's a manual that walks you through every step of it. So if you're a flood adjuster for FEMA and you follow that manual and you hit all those things, you're going to pay out whatever that policy allows. Um, sometimes, again, depending on your on your skill set or your experience uh, knowledge wise, um, sometimes some things are missed. Uh, but as long as you're able to prove that that is you know, caused by flood and it is covered, they, they typically will, will pay that. OK, you said something really interesting here. I want to back it up. You said according to what the policy allows. Yes. Is it possible for people to be underinsured? Uh, absolutely. Yes. I see that. I wouldn't say often, but I do see it. Because yeah. this is a, this is, I would, I'm going to, it's not a Canadian thing. When I had to get my, I, I recently bought a church. We were going to convert it to a house and I, I paid $240,000 for it. I went to the insurance company. They wouldn't let me insure it for 240 because that's all the risk that I had. Right. They made me pay to ensure the complete restoration of that in case of a fire. Mm -hmm. So I had to get a million dollars of coverage for that building. Sure. They wouldn't let me get insured otherwise. So how does it work down in the, in, in the U.S.? So I get a home in Fort Myers. It's a winter place. And I'm looking for insurance companies. And I've got multiple different policy options. Can I opt out of different kinds of coverage? Um, I don't know if you can opt out because uh, typically what happens is the, the average insurer calls the agent, says, hey, I need insurance. The agent's going to look up the property, try to put a value on it and then say, OK, here's the value that we have on the appraisal that we found on uh, you know, whatever system they use. And so yep. here's the value. Now, here's several options. So a lot of times they're not reading the policies to you. They're letting you know what's in them and they're, yep. you know, hey, you have full coverage. So then great, you know, you get one for, you know, 2,000, one for 1,500 and one for 900. You know, a lot of people are going to say, hey, you know, am I fully covered? I'll at the 900, the 900 if I'm covered, right? Oh, and it's not. What's the difference? What, what is the difference? What's in the nuance there? Right. Well, the thing is, is, is they don't, you don't know what's in that policy because sometimes the reason you have a $900 policy is because you have a wind exclusion. You'll have okay. a cost damage exclusion. Um, you're going to have different, you know, exclusions in there that you didn't know a water damage. I said, you know, there's a, a big one with one of the carriers I work for is I would say probably it was, it was over 70 percent of the people I went to because they had a little bit older homes. They had a water damage exclusion. And so when I would show up knowing that that's excluded, I'd have to introduce myself and explain to them, I'm sorry, you don't have coverage. Well, what do you mean? I have I have a replacement cost policy. Y you do, but not for water damage. You know, so this is what I'm talking about opting out. It's, it's all in the details, eh? Yes. And the thing is, they're, they're signing off on these, you know, on these paperwork because they, they do have to be notified that they don't have that coverage. But mm -hmm. then a lot of people get the paperwork, they sign it away, and they, they send it in without reading it or knowing what that means or how it's going to affect them if they have a loss. Okay. So let's just n numb this down. You can buy a house. Let's say it's worth 300000 mm bucks. -hmm. You can get insurance. You get what you pay for. Right. Is that fair enough to say? Absolutely like fair. If you want full coverage, you pay full price. If you want half coverage, you pay half price. Right. Your house is worth 300000 In the last 18 months, it's almost doubled in value. How many people still have full replacement value? Or did they put a limit on it based on the value of the home at the time the policy was taken out? It's, it's the time of the policy was taken out. So this is something that I've also run into is where people have a total loss fire. And they're underinsured because the, the supply chain. The materials go up. All these different things that increase the cost that yeah. aren't built in. Forget the about inflation. In right. our business, labor's gone through the roof. Materials are through the roof. The home's values through the roof, and right. no one's going to repair a five hundred thousand dollar home for three hundred thousand bucks. Correct. Because it was worth five hundred, but now the insurance is only going to cover you for three. Yeah. In your experience, Jason, how many people that have got that three hundred thousand dollar coverage when they need five 
get offered 300,000 from the insurance company? Um, I, I don't see that often uh, where they, I, I don't honestly can't remember when I've seen them offer those policy limits because you still have to prove that damage that you have. And so, and again, you know, insurance being a business, you know, it's not a charity. They're sending their people out to document it, you know, on their side. So if mm -hmm. you, again, it's a conditioner policy, you have to prove your claim to them. So if you're not able to prove what's covered, what those costs are, they're not going to, they're not going to pay it, you know, because again, they're using that policy. And again, it's nothing, nothing bad. It's a business, you know, and they're not trying to harm people. They're just using their people to use that policy for them where it's up to you to use that policy to prove it for yourself. Is, is it fair to say that insurance restoration in the U.S. is an adversarial system? Um, I mean, that's, that's hard to say. I mean, I don't know about adversarial. Am I going too far? Am I stepping on toes? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say anything bad about it. I mean, it's, you know, again, it's a business. They insure people. Those policies are made to pay you. Um, you just have to know, again, how to use it, and you have to know your coverages. And that's something I try to tell all my clients, a lot of people yeah. know, is when you're getting a policy, you want to shop coverage first and then premium. You want to make sure that your home is valued correctly, not at market value. <clears throat> what does it take to replace? If you had a catastrophic loss, what's it going to cost to rebuild that home entirely? Get all okay. those coverages in there. And then once your coverages are set, now you start shopping premium. All right. I get it. So we're going to, we're going to play nice. We're going to call insurance companies. Um, God-fearing men and women who are just trying to do their job. Sure. And that in the midst good. of it, people are underinsured for a lot of different reasons. And when they do need to make a claim, they need to then become an advocate or understand the system or have the temperament and character and personality to be contentious and, and engage in the conflict of negotiating, Yes. which we already know half people in the world don't like conflict and negotiating. Right. So there's 50% of the people in the world are going to go walked all over right out of the gate. What, 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 how many people on average contact an independent advocate to make sure that not enough, right? Cause like when you buy a house, you get a lawyer, you got a real estate lawyer. Right. And what they do is an hour and a half, they process 400 pieces of paper, but they're smart enough to know if you're going to get screwed and they point it out. Mm -hmm. How many people get an advocate? Um, I, I don't really know the numbers. I know it's a very small percentage. Um, no one really knows that a public adjuster exists or that they even have that option. Um, you know, over the years, the insurance companies are great at marketing, you know, yeah. like a neighbor, state farm is there, you know, all these different ads, you know, you're in good hands, all those things. Sure. So your entire life, you know, that's all, you know, so when it happens, you know, you trust that the insurance company is going to take care of you. Uh, but again, they're marketing. It, it, it's a business and they're out, you know, it, it's a for, for profit. So, um, you know, not a lot of people know that they have that option. Just like, you you know, you go to court, you have an attorney representing you. If you're, you're doing the taxes, you don't give out all your receipts to the IRS and let them do it. You know, just the same it. thing. And if you're in court and, and, and you know, if, if you're in court and, and the other opposing counsel is going off on a rant, you don't know how to object. You just let it go. I mean, you're you're in a whole heap right. of trouble. OK, sure. so fair enough. Um, uh um, how many people do you think that are in that storm in Florida have no coverage at all? Have Is no that even coverage allowed? At all. Are you allowed to own um, a house without coverage? If, if you, I, I believe uh, if you own it outright, you do not have to have insurance. Um, I have seen I have seen a lot of people that, um, you know, that didn't have insurance. Um, I've had some people brag to me about how much money they've saved at not, you know, having to pay the premiums. And I had one guy, well, you know, a few years ago tell me, you know, hey, uh, he's like, I just saved $300,000 in the last four years. It's like, well, this roof is $1.4 million. What? Yep. It's like, That's it's like you, you say, <laughs> look, now you had the catastrophe, you know, you, you now wish you would have had the insurance. Okay. And here's an interesting question, because um, we talked about FEMA's role, but I have one more question for you that's really kind of interesting. So I, I buy my $300,000 house. I put my 10% down. I owe two seventy dollars on a mortgage. My house became worth 500000 a few, little while ago. So I leveraged the loan, right? And I got myself an RV and some play money and some new clothes. Life is good. Isn't this the American dream? My house got hit by a storm. I'm only insured for three hundred. dollars Now I'm up two hundred grand. How long do you have to restore your house to the original condition before the bank says, hey, I'm taking your house from you because it's not worth what's on paper? I think... 
and, and this this one I, I'd have to look up, but I, I'm pretty I sure. I might be moving outside of your area of expertise here, but just you're paying your note. You know, you get to keep your house. It's when you default on that loan is, is when they're going to yeah. take it. Is you know, and also, um, you know, the mortgage holder has um, typically anything over five thousand dollars is going to go in your name, and then also the lien holder's name. So that way when the check comes in, you sign it, it goes to the mortgage company. They then hold that money and they will release it in draws as you're repairing that house. So they okay. want to make sure their, you know, their liabilities. So the insurance company isn't paying you direct. They're paying it to the lien holder. Correct. And then I mean, you go and say, here's my proof. I did this. Here's this invoice. Here's that invoice. They usually okay. do a 30, 10, 30 draw. Is what yeah, 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 yeah. Um, got a question here from uh, someone in Pittsburgh. Um, since the burden of proof is on the homeowner, what can we do ahead of time to make things easier? Like take video, photos of every room. If you do uh, upgrades. Yes, I, I have, um, you know, every once in a while I go around taking videos and pictures of my house. Um, yeah. That way, in case, you know, I, I, this never happens, but in case I have a fire, I want to make sure my contents are documented. I want to look at my, you know, my building or as far as the outside, what's damaged, what's not damaged, what's, you know, kind of been there that way when they come out, I'm able to prove, Hey, here's a photo, you know, or videos a month or two or six prior, there's no damage outside. Now we're finding this, these scuffs or these, you know, soot marks or these impact marks or whatever that you can prove to them. So videos and photos are absolutely, they're, they're wonderful tools uh, to be able to help prove your claim. Let's talk about that real quick. Cause we didn't dif differentiate between the structure and the contents. Mm -hmm. um, what are policies like for content insurance down in the States? Is it, as long as you can prove that you owned it, you're covered, or do they have maximum cash value for the policy owner and all that sort of thing attached? So typically I'm seeing whatever your coverage A is, you have 50% of that is your coverage C, which is contents. Okay. And how you different or the content is, is I tell people, take your house, flip it upside down. Whatever falls is going to be a content. Yeah. So not everything is able to be proven. Um, now, if you can save or keep your receipts as far as like your furniture, your, your large ticket items, you're able to show that. But other <clears> things... Um, I mean, when I was, uh, I don't know, I, I had to get people sometimes to have a picture of their child eating a cake and there was a vacuum cleaner in the background. So that proved they own that vacuum cleaner. And now it's, you know, it's burnt to, a, you know, melted yep. down. You can't tell. So just, got it. you know, little things like that. That's cool. I actually went, had an experience once. I went into someone's house and the basement had flooded during that storm. Right. And the basement was full of furniture, like full of furniture. And then we went upstairs and we found out they took all the living room furniture and put it in the basement into the flood just so they could get cash out on the furniture. And we're just like, yeah, that doesn't work that way. Right. I would uh, <laughs> anyway, um, guys, if you're at home, we're on the, on the, on live here with Jason. He's a, an insurance adjuster. He does private work. He helps people out when they get disaster and they got to deal with an insurance company who, um, you know, they're in business. So you might want to have someone who knows the business on your side. We're going to take questions for you in the chat real quick here. Let's just do this. Um, okay. Frank says, I just moved to Florida from Pennsylvania. Question is, I don't live in a flood zone, so how much flood slash wind coverage should I have? He has also got a lot of trees around me. Uh, hmm. How much flood? If you're not in a flood zone, I'm not in a flood zone, and I don't have flood coverage. Um, so I think certain areas you, you have to. Um, I know they rezoned my area at one point and I had to, to pay to, to get an assessment in order to, to, to show that I'm not. So, okay. I mean, personally, if I'm not in a flood zone or an area that's prone to flooding, I, I wouldn't spend the money for the insurance. But it always is there just in case, you know, you need it. As far as your wind coverage, you just want to value your building because most of the policies are on your uh, homeowner's policy and they're all perils. So that that policy is going to cover your wind, your fire, your water, all those things. So um, unless you you can't get wind coverage from your carrier, you have to go to another carrier to get wind coverage. That would be your wind policy. But generally for homeowners, you're able to get it, you know, under your, your regular homeowner's policy. All right. Well, here's a hypothetical question for you. I'm just going to throw this out there. And Eric, we can bring the comments up back to live again. And I'll, I'll start asking some of these questions. Um, huh. um, let's say... You uh, made a deal with the insurance company, you cashed out. And then later on down the road, you start to think and you've, you've ran into a problem doing your restoration. You're like, wow, the money didn't go anywhere near fur enough. Maybe I got screwed. And they contact someone like you. Okay. How long does a homeowner have before to go back to the insurance company and say, hey, by the way, this wasn't sufficient. How do, and how do you renegotiate? What's the, what's the avenue for that? Is it like, 
Is it like an appeal years. court or something? Yeah, you, you have three years, uh, I believe, with hurricanes to, to file your claim or to, to, to pursue it. So that's, uh, it depends on the on the type of do damage, the storm? Yes, it depends on the storm. Um, and then if I were to come in afterwards, I'm starting from scratch. I'm going to do my entire investigation, inspection. Mm. Uh, I'm going to look at what, you know, it, it's honestly difficult once you've made all the repairs and then realize you don't have money. So that's why it's really good because what you're purchasing is an insurance policy, not a construction policy. So right. the best way to go about it is to handle your claim first, get your budget, and then go back to the construction part. And now you have your budget to then do your, your construction needs or your rebuilding. So what we would do is we come in, we, we do a whole investigation as far as inspecting the building, looking at the policy, breaking out the coverages, and then applying what the market value or market cost is to get the job done. If it's not enough, then we're going to take whatever evidence we have, and then we're going to present that to the insurance company and ask them to, to um, open up the claim on a supplemental basis and then ask them to, to again, come out and meet with us. We're going to show them all the damages that we have, show them what the expenses are, and then make that request for them to pay what the what the actual cost is. As long as okay, so I'm, I'm going to play the insurance company, I'm just going to say no. No. How do, you, how do you force them to do it? How do we force them to do it? Well, we have we have different different ways. Um, yeah. we, we prove the claim. So as long as that damage is there and we can prove it, we're, we're going to work with them because do you have like a federal body that governs how you guys got to play ball together. Um, well, the department it state by state? oversees um, our our industry, the, the insurance and the banking industry. Um, but there's certain things we do, again, proving the claim, you know, as a licensed adjuster, we have the authority to negotiate with the insurance company. Uh, okay. bring up your adjuster and work together with them to show them how it applies to the policy or whatever statutes are there to protect the policyholder and to use that to try to get them paid. If they say so no, basically, if you stand up to the insurance company and say, Hey, uh, by the way, you guys dropped the ball here. This is what you should have paid them. And they say, no, then you're going to call them out on that. And would they be guilty of kind of like operating in bad faith and there'd be consequences? I don't like using that word bad faith. <laughs> But, um, but, but that, you know, like, I mean, let's face it. I mean, at the end of the day, we'd all like to think that six of us arrived on the same boat and we're all, we all got to take care of each other. But sure. Like, no. I mean, you know, read the news. My God. So like, there's, there's, I don't there's, want to use bad faith. Is that too legal? I, I, legal we're really good at documenting that file. Okay. So there's okay. things in that policy and in the statutes that the insurance company has to abide by. So just like the policy holder has conditions they have to meet to have a covered loss, the yeah. care has the same. So Who if, governs everybody's behavior at the end of the day? Right. Yeah. We all we all want to get along. We all want to get the claim settled because if, if you're having an argument, who governs that claim? Who who's the adjudicating body that would come up to a decision one way or another? Push come to shove. Department of Financial Services is who oversees the the insurance. Okay. So they are accountable to somebody. Yes. Okay. That's good to know. So you know, <laughs> just because they're throwing up a, a wall of resistance, folks doesn't mean that they're in charge of the end negotiation here. No. And I, if you're finding yourself in a position and you're at home and you've got a situation or a claim and you're not sure if you're covered or you think you've got more coverage or you're, you, you're, you know because your personality type that you're not negotiating as hard or as well as you could or you don't know enough about construction to know what you should be getting paid for, I'm making a recommendation. You know, research, guys like Jason. Um, public, public insurance adjusters. Is that correct? That's correct. Public adjusters. Right. Yep. Dude, thanks for coming on. I'm going to just see if we've got a couple more questions here. I know somebody wanted to know about condos. What, what? Yeah. Um, what insurance do you need as a homeowner if you're in a condo? You need an HO6 policy, which is a, it's okay. a policy for condos. So what that is, is that that's going to cover, um, you know, just a basic anything you can touch inside. So it's not going to cover the drywall. That's going to be the master association policy. Um, okay. Cover like flooring. Say, Contents, Floor, cabinets, cabinets, contents, paint, uh, additional living asset or uh, living assistance, and then also um, <clears throat> covers special assessment. So if your association has to assess you for their deductible to cover, yeah. then you also have a coverage in there. It's typically, I think, a minimum two thousand um, dollars in case you have to pay an assessment. That that's okay. So basically, important. flooring, fixtures, and finishes, and a little something there in case you got expenses related to the other insurance company. That's pretty cool. And, you know, that's true. I mean, if, if especially, you know, guys, if you're doing renovations and you're updating and doing DIY work, when you're done, document it. Um, most people don't understand the value of what they're putting in their home. I agree. Like you don't you don't you buy three dollar square foot flooring and you install it. You don't realize it's almost worth 10 bucks a square foot. Mm -hmm. 
because the labor is part of the insurance policy, even though you didn't have to fork out the cash to get it. It doesn't drop on and on itself. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't lower value. I always tell people, you know, if you want to invest money and you don't have a million dollars that you can afford to lose, then invest in yourself. Renovate your house, get a 300% return in 90 days. Yeah. All right. Um, um, okay, another question here is, heard insurance reps say that for major losses, it may be advantageous to do some repairs yourself because of the risk of getting dropped after big claims. Hmm. What about, hey, um, we don't like where you live. This is the second time there's been a storm. We don't want to cover you. What kind of what kind of situations are we talking there? Um, I mean, that happens where some carriers will, will pull out or they'll relocate because, you know, they're they're having a lot of losses and that's a lot of expense for them. Um, yeah. What you do is, I mean, I, I would shop around uh, and a lot of people, they have a friend that's an agent or they know an agent and they kind of go to that one person and try to have them, you know, find or shop around for policies. Um, when I'm shopping for insurance, I'm calling as many agents as I can and I'm getting as many options as I can because there, yep. there's a lot of carriers out there. Um, also, is there any benefit to, let's say um, everybody in my county is has got a $100,000 claim and I'm going to do the work myself. I'm only charging the insurance company 30. Are you going to get favor the next time you renew your policy? No, it's there. there there's no, there, you have a claim. You have a claim that paid out. You have a claim. It doesn't That's matter right. if you do it. I mean, I personally, if you know, you're, you're qualified, so you're going to have good quality work. Me, it would not look the same as if you did, <laughs> you know, Fair a, enough. a license. Fair enough for me and have them get paid correctly to do the job, you know, right. Cause I just, that's one thing. I that's like. awesome. Well, Jason, thanks again for joining us. Um, real quick. How can viewers get in contact with you or your office if they need help? Uh, we're www.altiriinsuranceconsultants.com and that's A L T I E R I insurance consultants, plural.com. And also uh, Jason at altiriinsurance.com. You can email me. I respond, you know, pretty quickly uh, to those things. So, Feel free to reach out. If you have any questions, again, we're here to provide a service to people and help. And, yeah. um, you know, that's awesome. Well, that's what we do, Jeff. So you're based out of Tampa. So you're driving back and forth to the south, what, once a week and just living down in the disaster zone right now? I'm, I, I'm out of Ocala, our corporate office in Tampa. And so I leave on Sunday night and I typically drive back on Friday night. Wow. So I get, I get wow. the weekend to spend with the family and maybe catch a football game with them because the kids are all playing. And then I, I come right back and get to work. So. That's that's a hell of a thing. Well, thanks for everything you've done, buddy. And thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, um, we'll make sure that we put his contact information in the video description. We'll post it a little later, guys. So if you need to follow up with him, just check back in a day or so. And I'm sure we'll have that information there. Jason, if I ever need you again, I am going to reach out because that was a great conversation. Right, Hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah. we helped some people out tonight. Yeah, me too. All right. Cheers, buddy. Take care. All right. Thanks. All right, guys. Well, let's get on with the rest of the show here. We wanted to talk about how to recover from a disaster. Oh, we have never done an interview before. My name is not Piers Morgan. And I'm just curious how that went. Um, Eric, is there any way that we would know how many people are still with us right now? Uh, right up here, we've got uh, 226. Okay. All right. Well, guys, like all... Pardon? Yeah, there we go. Brilliant. Well, we're here for a little while still. Um... So let's go full question and answer on my screen here so I can read these questions better. And we're still trying to sort that out. Yeah, interesting, eh? All right, well, we're still learning how to use our new stream here, guys. I can see them. It's just I really got to like go like this, right? It's not my good side. <laughs> Ah, uh, I think we're going to be okay. Okay, no worries. Well, listen, I know not every live show is for everybody, but for people who are struggling with this mess, it is uh, quite a hell of a thing. Um, and by the way, if you're in Texas and you made a deal with your insurance company, you feel like you might have got under undervalued in your claim, uh, reach out to somebody like that and find out if there's anything they can do for you. It seems like the timeline on disasters and how long you've got to respond and go back and renegotiate is based on the disaster itself. So I don't know. That's going to be a question I should have asked, but if it's three years for everybody out in Texas, you still got 18 months to go back and have a second look at your policy. Um, I can read it. That's even better. Yeah, we can do that. All right. Well, let's just go do Q and a for our members guys. Let's open this up.
If you got insurance questions, if you got disaster restoration questions, if you got a how do I get rid of mold in my house question, there was one question earlier about cat urine on the OSB. Oh. I know you'd think that is not that common, but bloody hell, it is. And Jess wants to know how do I get cat urine odor out of your subfloor? Carpet and LVP. Okay. Um, Man, I wish I could remember the name of the product, Jess. Here's the thing. What you want to do if you want to Google insurance restoration suppliers for your area or contact an insurance restoration company and say, hey, by the way, I've got a cat urine problem. And they'll have a technician. They'll actually be able to sell the service to you. They'll be able to come out. These products are available in like one or two liter jugs. And it's a solution that just kills the odor. Okay. It's absolutely incredible. Um, I can't remember the name of the product, but I know it exists. So if you call an insurance restoration company in your area and say, I got cat urine, can you send someone out? They'll charge you for a couple hours of labor or whatever. Uh, it might be worth your, 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 your anguish because there's a lot of things that work and a lot that don't. You can't just pour bleach till the cows come home. For whatever reason, it doesn't work. Bleach neutralizes on contact with organic material. And a lot of people who try to do that are, are left... Um, how should we say dissatisfied with the end result over time? Okay. So it's effective for a certain while for the first day or two, but your nose has also been neutralized to be able to smell anything because you're in that house with bleach. So what happens is a week later, the smell starts to permeate through the air again. And there's something about cat urine that 3% <laughs> cat urine in wood is enough to make it stink, right? So um, there's a certain product and I just can't remember what it's called. If anybody remembers, jump in and let me know. Otherwise, let's just go live in the chat and we'll see where the hell we are here. Uh, what do you mean? Chris wants to know where you can get the proper plateau since Home Depot no longer carries the heavy weight stuff. Um, they had it on the shelf at the Orleans store two days ago when I was there. So there you go. It's in the um, concrete aisle, generally speaking. Foundations, that kind of stuff. All right, so give that a shot. It's a six and a half foot tall roll, 60 feet long. All right, um, do you mean Zep? Zep is a manufacturer um, existential, and I'm. it may be a Zep product, but I'm not sure what, what the product is called. All right, so Bradley says there was a little whitewash, whitish mold on some of the floor joists. How to make sure I take care of that area and it not come back? Yeah, um... If you have floor joists that have mold and it's on the interior of your home <laughs> or the, this is the thing, mold comes from too much moisture, right? When there's too much moisture, the mold that exists in the wood can grow and it can proliferate. And there's all kinds of different mold. And depending on the dirt, where the tree came from, what, what was populating in the area, that's what you're going to get. So if your wood goes moldy, the wood's too wet too often. So you got to figure out how to dry the air around that, that floor joist. You can't just treat the mold and move on because the problem is the moisture that caused the mold to grow. And you can't kill 100% of the mold that's in a piece of wood. So no matter what you do, it's going to come back unless you can solve the moisture problem. So if you can identify the moisture problem and put like plastic ground sheet down or dehumidifier in a basement or something like that, the other thing you can do is you can spray your floor joists with an oil-based paint and it acts like a sealer so that the moisture can't get into the wood. That's what we did at the farmhouse. We spray painted uh, oil-based kills on all of the floor package just to help to keep it dry so that it wouldn't soak up all the moisture coming through all the masonry. All right. <laughs> um, all right, here we go. Yinzer house. It's an old cellar opening door that has been sealed off with concrete. Two foot section and the beam is exposed. Yeah, if, if it's a moisture issue, then Really, the only way to deal with it is just deal with the kills. You know, paint it up with an oil-based primer and seal it up. Okay, and that should take care of it. Treat it with bleach or concrobium first. All right, concrobium is a little bit easier to work with and doesn't stink so bad. Um, you can get that at your local Home Depot, and uh, that'll work. Okay. Oh, Jeff, can I tile over tile that has a bump out pattern? Yeah, sure. You just got to put down a thicker layer of thin set. Just adjust your travel size. Instead of quarter by quarter, go quarter by three-eighths. Or if that's not enough, go half by half. Um, at the end of the day, you're just adding, you know, a thin set and stone on top of something that's existing. 
So if it's not flat enough to get a good result being cheap on the thin set, then spend a lot of money on thin set. Problem solved. And then use some leveling clips to make sure that you get it nice and flat this time around. All right. Fantastic. Sherry wants to know, my house is such a mess. We had an arsonist in the neighborhood. Okay. I was hoping she saw the wood on the side of the house. Ah, that's not so much a question as a statement. <laughs> Maybe put up a note. Gone for the weekend. Help yourself. <laughs> Fully insured. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh. <laughs> oh, you want to... Okay, so you're in Pittsburgh, and you want to fill up concrete up to the beam, so you need a gap filler expansion gap for the concrete. Uh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Man, that is a hell of a thing. Dude, send me a picture for that one in the forum, will you? I have to take a look at that and, and before I can advise. Um, is that below grade, above grade, exterior, interior? Um, I need to get the, the goods on that for sure. Uh, wow, Sherry, maybe stop buying cars. That might be a good problem to solve. You keep getting your car stolen, stop buying them. <laughs> but get a bicycle and see what happens. Um, okay. Rigid insulation is probably a good solution to your, your, your separation issue. Yeah, for sure. If it's above grade, definitely. All right. Okay, guys. Uh, if you're going to ask me questions about your house, um, I am not the all-knowing. I need to know where you live, what kind of climate you get, interior, exterior, upside, second floor, third floor, ninth floor, whatever it is. Give me as much detail as you can in the question. Uh, it's okay to expound. But uh, definitely the region that you live in, and if it's inside or outside your home, when you ask me questions, it helps. Oh, my goodness. And the age, actually, it's where you live and how old the house is is really the major keys here, right? Um, <laughs> so Dave says he's got some water seeping up in the middle of his basement. Okay. Had the city in, and it isn't a backup issue. Any ideas for next steps? Kind of love how the city comes out and says, yep, not my problem. Good luck, buddy. All right, Dave. There's such a thing called the water table. If you watch enough movies, you'll see somebody dig a hole to make a well. And they dig down far enough that the water starts to come up in the hole. That's the water table. And it's it's every, every region has its own water table. And it's the level of the water is saturated the soil beneath the surface. Some houses are built in a place where the water table is pretty shallow. And depending on regional construction, you can affect how the water table manipulates and moves and grows and lowers. And you can find yourself in a situation where you need a sump pump. Not every house that needs a sump pump got one because it hasn't been part of the building code for a long, 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 long time. It's actually a pretty um, new addition to the building code, relatively speaking. So if you have an older house and you've got water in the middle of your floor, it's because the water... Has, has, has raised up as high as the footing and maybe even higher. And so it's coming in through the sides and it's coming through the cracks in the floor itself. You need to dig a hole beneath your floor, put in a pump and drain the excess water away. And that should solve that problem. If not, put in two or 10 or move. <laughs> At the end of the day, if you can't keep the water out of your basement, you're in a whole heap of trouble. You're in Canada in the 70s. Yeah, no sump pump was needed in the 70s. They let you build. And trust me, there is a lot of water out there in Canada. That's just a western suburb of Ottawa. So you're not alone. Um, man, I almost want to say it. A lot of Canada is swamp. And they would throw some pebbles in the swamp and say, there's a foundation, build a house. That's a bit of a dramatic exaggeration there, but you get the idea. You build enough houses in a swamp, it pushes the water table up. Because of the weight of all that construction and all that displacement, okay? And so um, you'll see when you drive around Canada, they've got large valleys and water retaining areas and everything all over the place. Really dramatic. That's not normal, okay? You don't see that everywhere you go. You don't go down to Brampton and see massive construction to manage water. It's because you get, they built the entire city about three inches above a water table. So... Understand that you're at risk, and if you're starting to have problems now, you just need a sump pump. They bust a hole in your ground. They stick the pump below the water line. They put in the pump, and they solve your problem. And uh, you live to fight another day, my man. All right? 
Uh, Chris says he's on a big basement project. No idea how much time he had to spend on education, cleaning, organizing, shopping. Building is only about 30%. Could use some more help on where to shop. What are you buying? And I'll let you know. Chris, and I, I think, Chris, you're in Ottawa, right? If I got that correct, you're over by Ikea. Let me know what you got to shop for, and I can give you some suggestions. And Sherry has got a lot of story here. Fire in a second. Wow. Okay. I like prefer when I'm doing question and answer to have a question. Because I can't just sit here and read your story, Sherry. That's, that's not very good TV. Although it's interesting. I'll be honest with you. Um, yeah. My goodness. Uh, Robert. 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 You had wind damage a year ago. Loosen the nails on the fascia. Yeah. Uh, something happened there. Uh, it damaged it and also lost some of the soffit pieces. Yeah, never repaired it and never thought to put in an insurance claim. Is it too late? <sighs> you know what the truth is? Soffit is neither that expensive or that difficult. Um, I would take a look at your deductible before you make a claim. Because you make a claim, you make a claim. And insurance companies, they, they track claims like sports injuries. Okay. And you can only blow out your knee so many times before you are not ever going to make it to the majors. So you, you make a claim, you make yourself uninsurable if you do too often. So something like that would be mild enough. I'd be tempted to just go buy a couple pieces of soffit and nail that stuff in myself. All right. Uh, I wouldn't ever make a claim on that. Okay. If you can't DIY it, then talk about making a claim, but avoid making a claim until you're absolutely necessary. Um, you guys, you guys found a shallow eight inch storm drain pipe clay in the ground since been buried dirt clogged, not running for years, future flood risk or rebury cut and forget they exist. Yeah. Any old clay pipes were there to move water away from your house somewhere else. And they're not under pressure and they're probably not tied into any system. It was probably just for drainage. Um, I'd love to know how old your house is there. Yenzer in Pittsburgh, but, uh, that is called weeping tile. And nowadays it's a, it's a rigid plastic with holes drilled in it and usually has like a, a nylon sock over top so they can keep the dirt out. But in the old days, it was just like clay roof tiles stacked in reverse on top of each other in one direction. And it was just to move excess water away from the house. And they weren't trying to keep the house dry. They were trying to keep it not wet, if that makes any sense. Um, it's old technology. It's useless. And it shouldn't cause you any issue. You should just be able to move on and not think about it. Frank is here and he says uh, he wants to wallpaper. Wow. Does that, is that even English? I think he meant paper. Yeah. Like a retaining, a retaining wall paper in Central Florida. What do I do to help with settling of pavers? Do I? Mm. Retaining wall and it's got settling. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, the thing about retaining walls is you should only build those on a compacted foundation. And if the compacted foundation is sand and you get too much rain and water in an area like recently, then your foundation can wash away. And so you're really at a position where you got to rebuild it. There's not a whole lot else you can do. You know, didn't they teach that everybody in church when you're a kid? You know, you build your house upon the sand and the storm came. Yep. <laughs> you ever seen? I we were on vacation in Florida and we were what? 30 feet from the, from the beach? Second house in? 10 houses away from the ocean and they're building a house slab on grade on sand. You like, you know, you, you wonder why you're in trouble if the, if, if the storm surge comes because all the sand underneath your house gets washed away and then that's holding up the house and then your slab cracks. So yeah, um, pay attention to that because if it happens in a year or two from now, it might be related to the storm previously. Okay. And then uh, you can go back to the insurance company and say, by the way, Michael, I replaced the door frame on a garage. Rough opening is three -ish inches out of square. Wow. <laughs> See now, but it could be better. Recommendations on squaring up the opening. House built in 1941. Um, <laughs> put in a smaller door and reframe the interior. That's about the only option you got. If it's that bad, that means you've got a major foundation issue. Um, and if you're not going to fix the foundation, Squaring off the door is just going to leave you right where you were. It'll keep on moving. Uh, remember, 1940s, we didn't have a building code. So it was just, you got lucky or you didn't. And so here we are. 
you didn't get lucky. Sorry, bud. There's not much you can do. But if you can always reframe inside of it and make your slab shorter and make your slab narrower, um, there's no rule about that. Okay. So Sherry's saying, if you can't get help from anyone, contractors, lawyers, insurance, there's a lot of damage. Would it be better to give up and sell as is? Never. Don't ever give up and sell that is because they're going to give you 50 cents on the dollar of your current damage condition. All right. So the best option is contact one of these private insurance adjusters and let them fight for you to get you top dollar. All right. And then you can make the decision if you want to sell as is, but get paid from the insurance company first. Um, wow. And realize that you're not going to get the money directly. You're going to get the money in order to rebuild. And I think that's the biggest issue we've got to take away from this. If they're only going to pay the, the, the title holder so that you can rebuild, and then you got to do work and then submit the claim to recover the money that you've spent, you might not get all the work done before you get there. So consider DIY on your repairs, okay? So that at the end of the day, whatever's left is still yours. Like once you're restored, you're restored. And if there's a balance owing, it's your money. You're allowed to work to restore your house and cash in on that work and charge it as labor for yourself. So consider that. Chris, I did spray foam into the rim joist. I can't read that, dude. There we go. Uh, 1964 house. It's amazing. I should have done it years ago. Yeah. Um, just a quick pass of spray foam on the rim joist. Connecting all of those little pieces of wood gets rid of all that air leakage and all of that. And it gives you a seal and a thermal break. And then you can add a little more insulation for comfort and thermal break, thermal barrier, sorry. But spray foam on the rim joist is probably one of the most underappreciated concepts. Um, we're working in a house right now. We just started filming a brand new basement series. I should advertise that. Uh, <laughs> the way they built their house was simple. They, they did all the framing for the basement to put bad insulation in. But before they did any insulation, they spray foamed all the rim joists and they spray foamed the top plate to connect to that foam going into the rim joist. So there is going to be a complete thermal break all the way through that house with no air leakage and no ability for mice to get in. It's going to be perfect. Ah, uh, there you go. Form, form, form. Brenton, quality of the stream just dropped. Don't worry about that. Back, yeah. it's a Interesting. It's not our fault. It's here. Well, you know, the internet is what it is. Um, Dave says, cheers. I assume selling a sump pump is not a DIY job, correct? You know, that all depends on you, Dave, but all you got to do is cut a hole in your concrete slab. Um, you know, pickaxe, uh, skill saw with a masonry blade or rent an SDS, um, hammer chepper from Home Depot for an afternoon and bust a hole. Um, and then dig out the hole and then put in said plastic pump pit. And then you can install a pump and one inch pipe and exhaust it and, there's, uh, we haven't done a video on the whole process on our channel yet, but there's information online for that. It's blood, sweat, and tears, but it's not tricky. You just have to bring over a power source, um, a 15 amp, that you can pl plug the pump into. And I would suggest if you're going to do it and you've got that much of a water table, buy two pumps and set the floats at different heights. Okay? And so that way, if the first pump burns out, the second pump will kick in. All right. And then there's little electronic gadgets you can get to put next to the pump hole. And if the water comes up and the alarm goes off, it'll notify your phone, all kinds of great stuff out there. They got marine car batteries set up to back up pumps in case the power goes out. All kinds of great gadgets. We should probably do a show on that one of these days. But uh, definitely, definitely, definitely want to have not just one pump, but two, an emergency power backup and something to notify you that there's an emergency if you're out of town. So that you can say, hey, to your friend who's watching the house for you, get over there. The cord fell out of the pump on the plug or something or reset the breaker or whatever. Right. Uh, yeah. But those are all those different things you can do to protect yourself. Tony Bloom, 60 year old house in Green Bay. Go Packers. Pulled out original roof bat insulation to repair the wiring. Bats still have good form to them. But the facing paper edges used to staple them up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're a little destroyed, okay? Um, well, here's the deal. Tony, if you took out the insulation with some care and the bat is still good, understand that the paper was just there as part of an installation technique. It was probably treated to act sort of like a vapor barrier, right? But you're in a region that doesn't really need a vapor barrier. You can just stick the bat back in 
and grab some of that tuck tape and tape the paper back to the joist. The paper liner on that installation, just tape it back in place and then close it up as soon as possible, right? That'll work. I mean, you can always put all the insulation and then strap the ceiling and then add your drywall so the, the bats don't fall out. That's another way to do it, okay? Um, so don't be too concerned about it. That paper doesn't provide you that much protection. Uh, it, it's not real building science. It's just building convenience. All right. Cheers. How beneficial is it to cock around fixtures, lights, outlet switches, et cetera, regarding energy saving? Um, it's only helpful if you stop using your front door. <laughs> and I say that for the following reason. Um, uh, Listen, the, it's not about caulking. It's about air sealing, okay? So if you really want to seal up your, your, your plugs and your switches so that you're not getting drafts because of insulation, then take the cover off, remove the fixture all the way out, and then put spray foam, not in the electrical box, but through the holes in the back of the electrical box and foam up the, the cavity around it. Most insulation that's installed around electrical boxes is done lazy, quick, and stupid, okay? It's not inspected. It's not... It's not done with integrity. And so then you have actually a void behind the box where there's no insulation. So you get a cold draft. So if you just shoot foam through the back of your electrical plugs and just whoosh, let it foam up, that's going to give you a much better seal and eliminate the draft. Adding caulking to the front, it's you're solving 5% of that one particular problem. Okay. But if you really want to seal up your house, spray foam is a solution. Hi, Sandy. No, you're not late at all, darling. We, uh, we just got started a little earlier today is all. No big thing. Uh, now we got, oh, I don't want to talk about California. It's amazing. You know, it's like, can, here's an analogy of California. The ship's going down. The rats are jumping ship. And the captain is worried about how pretty his little flag is on top of the pole. Really getting tired of it. Doesn't make no damn sense. Doesn't make no damn sense. Like, Everything is so bass backwards out there. It's not even funny. I, I, I run my channel based on being practical. Um, they should look that word up in the dictionary and maybe start applying some practical solutions to real problems. It's nuts. They, they don't have any labor. They don't have any money. They don't have any electricity. They don't have any power. They don't have any gas, but you're not allowed to plug in your car. Blah, 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 blah. No one wants to live there. Taxes are outrageous. Figure it out, folks. It's a beautiful state. Be a shame if nobody wanted to hang out. Um, the box stores sell little foam squares you can put between your wall and your face plates too. Yeah, that's more effective than caulking, but spray foam is more effective than that. Um, yeah, here's the thing. If you've got a bad draft at your plug and you don't foam in behind it, you do have an airspace, which means in the winter you get ice there. And then when it thaws, you get water. And if that happens over and over and over again, your wood goes rotten and you get moldy walls. So it's worth insulating that cavity. If you have a draft that's noticeable enough, you have a space worth insulating, okay? That's just a good rule. Ah, you have a shed that can only be three feet deep because it doesn't need a permit. Can I just center the studs or will it, will it throw something off? No, don't worry about centering the studs. It's just a shed. You're just supporting your facade. So whatever sticks you need, to, if you could do three sticks for every eight-foot sheet, it'd be fine. So don't worry about that, all right? Just try to keep it simple. Uh, three-foot shed doesn't have to support much weight anyway. So don't even worry about it. Um, I don't know. If there's no questions for a second, why don't you tell us a little bit about your basement project you're working on? Yeah, Maybe there you go. It's been a while since we shifted gears into the basement. Oh, right. Well, and listen, let's just tell you. Uh, you know, we were working on the church for a while. We're getting our um, occupancy permit down there. Uh, we're all finished the work. And that's great. We're not sure what we're going to do with it yet. We're going to head back down south for the winter again and do some projects down there. However, I'm not going to sell the church quite yet. I'm holding out hope that we'll be able to actually move forward with that project next year, that things will normalize. So in the meantime, uh, we reached out to a friend of ours because we really, really, really wanted to do a basement series. And... It's, it's good friends of the family. Like, uh, my God, it's like my third daughter. <laughs> you know, Sam went to high school with my daughter, Christina, and they went to university together. And 
we turned their two bedroom um, apartment into a three bedroom so that everybody could afford to live there. And now she's getting married and her and her new man have built a new house. They got hit by COVID. His business was affected dramatically by it. So they couldn't finish the downstairs. And so uh, we had an opportunity to go in there and, and they're giving us carte blanche to do whatever we want to do down there with a couple of guidelines, of course, you know, it's their house for God's sake. But we're going to do an amazing series. We're going to teach you guys. They're doing an awesome theater room. Okay. They're, they're doing subfloor system. They're doing hardwood floors in a basement. Yeah. We're going to do some built-in TV wall cabinetry. We're doing bulkheads. We're doing all kinds of sound mitigation. They've got bedrooms down there. We're doing soundproofing for the bedrooms. It's going to be an amazing series. And so we are just started filming that a week ago. And um, this will be good. No, I haven't seen chocolate lately, Sandy. Sorry about that. Yeah, good question. Where are you, chocolate? Um, here's the deal. Once we're done that, my God, we're, we're going to be rolling. We have something else coming up for us, so don't we? What is it? Is it two weeks? In terms of yeah. yeah. Like this weekend, we have a huge A to Z coming out, right? Yeah. yeah. Next week, we start a new shed series. This is going to blow your mind. We we want to do a shed series to celebrate 10 million views. Uh, we're almost at 12. We we filmed this a while ago and we put it in the queue. We got it edited. Um, this is a new shed. It's ground level. It's integrated into a deck. Okay. And it's post and beam construction. It's really, really simple construction. And it, it, it makes all kinds of things possible. Okay. So what we did with them is they we gave them a, a garden center and a place to put their lawnmower and a custom awning with the flip up bar. Yeah. It's kind of stupid. Um, but it gives you the idea. Whatever you can imagine when you're working with post frame, you can make happen. So the post frame shed is coming up in two weeks. You're not going to want to miss that. Uh, Max filmed that with me in a beautiful 4K in the gorgeous summertime. Of course, whenever I build a shed, I have to do it in the hottest days possible. Don't ask me why. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. So make sure that you guys are um, watching out for that. It's going to be great. Mm. Oh. Oh, well, it's 6 o'clock. What do we got going on, guys? Is it quiet tonight? Yeah, nothing wrong with it. It's okay. Pardon? I don't know. Maybe there's an election. Maybe maybe Ukraine just got nuked or something and everybody's watching the news. I have no idea. <laughs> That's not funny, but it's possible. It's a crazy world we live in, eh? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, like as always, we're here to answer questions. So if you've got some questions, fire off. Otherwise, I'm going to go home early because I'm working my butt off and I'm a little tired. I'm not going to apologize if you don't mind. If you've got a finished basement, if you're looking, if you're thinking, I want to, I want to modify this, I want to finish it, I want to make it nice. Yeah, yeah. What's the first thing you think of? If I have an unfinished basement and I want to make it nice, what's the first thing I think of? Yeah, you're looking at these, you've got the studs exposed, you've got the concrete floor. Okay, the first thing I want to know is, is it waterproofed from the outside? If it's not waterproof, I'm not investing a lot of money in it. Because the, the, the likelihood that it's going to get destroyed is huge. Right? So why invest? So waterproof from the outside is uh, modern waterproofing. Yes. Uh, it's either it's either you dig a trench and you put a membrane, goes right to your weaving tile, or you dig a trench inside and you put in a French drain and then you put a vapor barrier waterproofing system on the inside of your masonry. But you cannot allow moisture from outside the house in that basement or you can't build anything. We've been trying... For forever here to figure out a way to finish a basement that doesn't go to mold in older homes. And there is just no technique that works. They've tried, they've tried every bloody idea possible. At the end of the day, water wins. So if you're not going to waterproof, whatever you do in your basement is temporary. And that's not bad. You can still make a living space or somewhere for your kids to be stupid, but don't put a lot of money into it. I moved to a house once and uh, my boys were young and dumb. And I'm like, you know what? I just bought a cheap roll of carpet, threw it down, no underpad, no, no, nothing. Threw a few sheets of drywall up, called it a, a living room for them. That was it. I think I invested 250 bucks. Didn't tape it, didn't paint it, didn't do nothing. <laughs> Cause I knew the minute I put it in that basement, it was garbage. So that's a thought. Is it snowing somewhere? Somebody, I don't know where uh, Brenton's from. Brenton, where are you from? Like, 
Tamagami? Oh, do they get snow in Timmins? Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's amazing. Oh, okay. Is there anything wrong with using traditional baseboard trim as a crown? In theory, no. You can nail it up to make it look normal. You're just going to use a lot of cocking to close the gaps because baseboard are square in the ends and crown is all 45 so that it fits into that, you know, the angle. But and and the fact that most baseboard that you see is obviously bought at Home Depot and everyone's going to know you use baseboards as a crown. So there's that to consider, right? Um, if you have extra baseboard, um, sell it on Kijiji or Facebook and then go buy a crown. Okay? Don't go through all that time and energy installing and cutting and nailing and patching and caulking and painting just, just to have baseboards on your ceiling instead of crown molding. Um, it's just not going to give you the same kind of result as you're looking for. Here we go. Your questions never end. Well, that's fine. I mean, I'm here. I'm live. Let's do it. You're older home than you. 1871. 1871 was older than me. Yeah. Yeah. Than my, my house was a young bride. Yeah. <laughs> the floor joists in the basement sit on a stone foundation with no sill plate. So far, no issues, but cause for concern. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes and no. The old growth trees that they usually use as the floorboards in those houses were old growth. Like they're super old trees, right? Like, and so generally speaking, they, um, they manage that transfer of moisture from the stone into the atmosphere a lot better. Okay. You're going to find that after the first hundred years, which is like 1971, 1970, whatever, you probably need to put in a couple of telescopic posts to shorten the span that they're carrying in order to keep things like functioning properly. Um, they don't last forever, right? So if you're investing heavily and you're going to make it so it's another 50 years of beautiful, I would say you're probably at that precipice where investing in some new floor joists might not be a bad idea. It just, they start to rot and, and they decay and they don't last forever in that condition. So um, I'm going to go on record as saying, if you have a house from 1871 and you got, you got a, you got, a, you got a floor package sitting directly on the stone, jacking up your floor package. That's actually a brilliant idea. Thank you, Jeff. That was a brilliant idea. Let me show you. Can we uh, zoom out here just a little bit? Oh, yeah. While we got him on here, and he's got all these questions, I'm going to just draw a pretty little picture. Here's your stone wall. Okay. <laughs> and here's your floor joist. Right? This is actually not the floor joist. The floor joist goes to here. Okay? Traditionally, what they did is they put an 8 by 8 beam on the stone wall on the exterior, and they built the house on that beam. And this floor joist has all the floorboards coming all the way across and stop right here. And these two are disconnected from each other. All right. They're sitting on a stone wall, which in most cases is an interior wall and an exterior wall built right next to each other with a cavity. Right. It's crazy construction. But what you have is an exterior of a house and then the interior of the house built inside on a different foundation. So it's a double foundation. So if this is sitting right on the stone, you put in a telepost, okay, and you jack it up until you can put a vapor barrier in between, some sort of a sill plate to stop the moisture transfer from the stone into the wood, and that'll stop the aging process. You can't do that with the exterior, unfortunately, okay, and that's where your biggest problem lies, right? So sooner or later, these houses are all going to become worth nothing. <laughs> right so the, the more you can keep it dry the better so keep your ground level down make sure you get all your water diverting away from your house and try to keep it all as dry as humanly possible but that's how you can make sure you can manage the moisture transfer and that's all you can do give it a jack slide something in and set it back down and you can work through the main floor and you can get that fixed all right all right <sighs> You know, we just don't know how long houses last made of wood construction like that in this climate because we've only been here for a couple hundred years. 
<laughs> it's not like we're in ancient Rome and we know if the ruins are going to still be standing, right? Oh, my goodness. There's a reason that those houses are cheaper than brand new ones. <laughs> uh, he's, he's building a secondary suite, it looks like. Yeah. So rent for, did Chris get back to me what he was looking to build, what materials he needed, where to shop? No worries. Um, Mr. Gork, can you elaborate on spray foaming in the window casing? I have an 1890s home in New England and I plan on sale at my windows. I don't know what just happened. We're, we're sealing the windows this weekend. Um, yeah, sure, we'll elaborate. I'm going to pull out the old pen again, but I'll trust me, I'll just make this work on camera. I can see myself in the picture. You don't have to worry about it. Um, so you got a frame and you got a window. Okay, well, let's just, that looks like a window. And the frame is always bigger than the window. Okay, and there's usually shims right here off the edge of the frame because that's where the structural load is for the window. And this is air gap, air gap, and they'll throw in a couple of screws on each side, and the rest of it is an air gap. And the air gap, let's say in real life, is about three and a half inches from the front to the back. And if this is the outside, you want to stick your straw all the way towards here and put foam there and let it grow towards the middle. And as long as it has room to expand, okay, so as long as it can expand from the outside towards the inside, everything will be fine. And then when it's done, you can trim off the inside and you're good. You want the foam to be at the same place where the glass is in the wall. So let's take a look at this this way. Here's the cross section of a window. How do I draw this to make any sense? Um, okay, so from the top down on a wall, all right? Um, yeah. So the window is going to be this thick. Okay. You're going to have a brick facade or something, let's say. All right. And then the glass is usually here. Okay. Set back. And there's this. And there's going to be brick mold or some kind of trim. And this will be the frame of the wall. Okay. And this is where they have the insulation. So somewhere the glass is in contact with this insulation cavity zone. That's where you want to spray foam. You don't want to spray foam up here and allow the cold air to sneak through. That makes sense? So here again, here's the wall. Here's the insulation. This spot where the, the glass is, you want to have your foam right here. That continues the R value all the way across. All right? And gets rid of the draft. I know the glass isn't as good as the foam or the bat, but it's better than if you foam too close to the surface on the interior of the house. And it looks good from the inside. It looks like it's insulated, but the wind can actually blow right through. All right? And that's the goal. Hopefully that helped. All right. Ah. The basement is a huge empty room now. Brought it back to the cement and started over. Ceiling and pot lights are done. Fixing the stairs this week. Found $20 solid oak stair treads. Cool. Light sconces and electrical. Okay. Gotcha. Would I recommend LBL beam or steel beam above a garage door? Garage roof is sagging and the beam needs to be replaced. Um, unless your garage door is extremely massive, LVL is a lot easier to work with because you can laminate them on site during construction and they can definitely go 16 feet. So not a concern, right? Um, yeah, okay, steel might be better, but then you need to have 20 friends or a crane or a rental machine or something else to facilitate the installation. Either way, you're dealing with structure, so I, I'm going to trust that you have structural drawings because I'm not an engineer. Um, but that's how I would do it. If I was you and I wasn't getting an engineer, I'd use LVLs because two people can lift those into place and screw them in and they're strong enough. The trick is LVLs come in all kinds of shapes and sizes depending on the structural load bearing and what the engineer calls for. So if you don't know how big the LVL should be, just because you bought one doesn't mean it's fit for the job. So that's that's an issue. So get some help and make sure you're putting in the right product. Um, <laughs> wow. You don't want to get a you don't want to get a Chevy if you need a Cadillac, you know what I'm saying? 
Any tips for doing repairs under vinyl siding during the winter? Well, don't do it during the winter. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, <laughs> if it's there right now, it's too late to touch it. It's getting too cold. Except maybe on Saturday, it's going to be nice and warm. But if you got to do repairs on vinyl uh, and, and you got to wait the winter out, then just grab some tuck tape and put some plastic on your siding and tape it up and treat it like a damaged roof. Okay, it's part of your water diversion system. And uh, just protect what's behind it until the spring. Oh, Sherry wants to know, speaking of spray foam, the gun that I said to buy, if I leave it on the can, clean it up and forgot to use it within 30 days, is there a way to get it to work again? That's a great question. Um, generally, no. It's a professional tool and it kind of works really well because it's used every day and it's cleaned intermittently. So if you have one of the guns and you're done your project, just unscrew the can and then use the cleaner and then put the cleaner on the can and clean the gun out. And then that's how you store it for use the next time. Um, I'm guilty of the same thing. I've gone through at least a half a dozen of those guns in the last two years. Uh, you know, you get busy and you leave it in a corner and you forget and you go, ah, I started buying the plastic ones instead of the metal ones just to save myself a few bucks because <laughs> I kept forgetting. But listen, yeah, it's at the end of the day. Um, anything that's that's been exposed to air will cure. So, you know, that's just how it works. Um, sorry about that. I got a leak in the drain line in my master bath. Is there some way to seal it up without opening up anything until we redo the bathroom? Northern Virginia house. Got a leak in the drain without opening any of that. I don't know, Martin, if you got access to underneath, you might be able to try spray and seal. You know, there's like spray seal products that are out there. If you've got a small leak, that might get you through. Drain water isn't usually under that much pressure. So if you applied some of that, that might get away with it. But if you don't have access to it and opening up means opening drywall, then there's nothing really you can do from the inside. Um, unless, you're, unless your leak is coming from the drain fitting and the threads of the tub itself. Then you can loosen it up a little bit, throw in a bit of silicone, tighten it all down and see if that fixes it for you. That's about the only option you got. All right. Good luck with that. Uh, Robert wants to know, when insulating rim joists. I've seen spray foam, rigid foam, or bat videos. Leaving money aside, any recommendation, which is best for mold, fire, unforeseen future issues, etc. Okay, the best system in the planet for doing a rim joist is to spray foam it, all right, and then cover it in drywall and put a, at least a first coat of drywall tape on the framing so that you have a 20-minute burn time when there's a fire. And the reason you only want 20 minutes is, I don't give a damn who you are. If you're in that house after 20 minutes that a fire starts, you're dead anyway. So don't worry about your rim joists. Like, just face it. <laughs> Spray foam, yeah. If it gets in contact with fire, it's incredibly poisonous. But so is your bloody couch. So, you know, think about it. Um, if you have a fire, get the hell out of your house. Um, your construction technology really doesn't really come into effect with fire unless you have multiple units or an adjoining unit or you got special needs and you need to construct the house to give you time to evacuate effectively. The average house, you know, you have a fire, your escape plan should be 30 to 60 seconds. That's about as long as you can hold your breath. All right. Um, anything else? Whatever. Like I know we had a problem here once there was a house here in Canada and they were in renovation. They sprayed foam the walls. And the family was living in the home. Unfortunately, they had a fire in the basement before they closed it up. And those fumes are toxic and it overwhelmed the family long before they even woke up from their sleep. And that's crying shame. So, yeah, if you're putting in spray foam in your house, make sure you close the damn stuff up before you go to bed. Right? That's uh, best practice. Don't be afraid to get a hotel room for a couple of days. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Some things just require a little bit more care or a roll of the dice. Ah, hey, Jeff, has asphalt roofing technology changed much in the last decade? We'll be in need of one of the next five to 10 years, but not sure if it'll be the same old. Um, no, we're basically dealing with hot tar, right? Um, torch on roofs are still your best bet. The problem with the torch on roof on your house is your house is so bloody old that 
there is a sensitivity factor with using that much fire and heat on old lumber because it can just combust. Okay. So whoever's doing that roof really needs to be a pro. I'm not even a big fan of using a torch on a house that's 100 years old just because it's so easy to set the, 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 the wood on fire. All right. Um, there's an incredible amount of care because remember what they do is they take their, their roll on their right and they've got a torch and they're trying to heat up this section. You can't see that, can you? Let's try this. They get it rolled like this, okay? And they're trying to heat this piece, then it lay it flat, and then it'll be adhesive. But if all you do is get a little lazy, and you get a little torch here, and you get one little gap in the plank or something, and the fire goes in there, instantly the attic catches, and you're done. Your whole house burns to the ground over somebody not being 100% efficient at their job. I don't like to take risks like that because I don't expect anybody to be 100% efficient at their job. <laughs> and so I'm not going to roll the dice on a torch on roof on a 100-year-old home. I don't care. Um, maybe take a look at using metal. Or if it's a flat roof, yeah, I would, I would call the guys that use the buckets and pour it on instead. Man, that's a conversation to have with a roofer. Ah, wow. Um, my newborn still won't sleep. Will flex tape work? <laughs> no, but a little bit of pablum is the secret. When I was young, uh, our doctor was 80 years old when I was young, which means he's like a thousand years old. And he gave us advice when our babies wouldn't sleep. He said, listen, I know you aren't giving them food yet, but if you throw a little bit of pablum in with your formula and then you give that to them, guaranteed you'll at least get four hours, mom. And if you're sane, your baby's sane. Because when mom don't sleep, nobody's happy. And so we followed his advice. And uh, all the newer doctors are, oh, problem, I don't know about that. Doesn't sound like a good idea. You know, well, <laughs> well, doc, you tell her that at three o'clock in the morning when she's got you by the throat. I love problem. I love problem. Dear God, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Why aren't interior walls insulated? Wouldn't this be beneficial for increasing our value and or energy efficiency of the home? No, there is no value in insulating interior walls for energy efficiency. It's like, why don't you have a sweater wrapped around your heart inside your body? Because you're insulating the exterior, right? That's what houses do. We have a thermal envelope. It's the outside. You can, you can insulate all the walls inside the house you want. We have one furnace and ductwork going to every room. So insulating each room from each other does no good at doing anything for you. The only benefit is in sound management. And the reason we don't have rules for insulating interior walls for sound management, well, let's just face it, nobody gave a rip because all you ever did in your house was eat and sleep. Right? When they wrote the building code, we didn't have gaming systems. We didn't have computers. We didn't have home offices. Kids stayed out until their parents dragged them home to go to bed, right? Like the world has changed. Now we need to have building code for soundproofing bedrooms and offices and different zones because people are spending so much time at home and it would be beneficial, but it's zero benefit for your thermal bar barrier. Anyway, <laughs> no idea what pablum tastes like. Um, Wow. It's like little pieces of white paper, as far as I can tell. Right. <laughs> I have no idea. I think it's just rice, basically. It's just a carbohydrate. But it expands, and it makes the stomach feel full. And so babies will sleep not feeling hungry. <laughs> Basic science, right? What am I, a doctor? Dear Lord. Come on, Jim. I'm a doctor, not an engineer. Duh, Jeff, when doing a shower, where the cement board meets the drywall, okay, for an outside corner, do you use a metal corner bead and then feather out the mortar on the cement board side before tiling? Sure. Why not? That outside corner isn't going to be in the shower anyway, right? And if it is, then continue around the corner with more cement board and just use your 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 mesh tape and your thin set and then your waterproof membrane to finish your corner. All right? And tile it. But if it's not tiled, it's not inside the shower. So go ahead and use a metal corner bead. Metal touching your thin set and your cement board isn't going to damage the metal. 
right? Just make sure that after you put the corner bead on, you use your waterproof membrane to separate the corner bead from the water so it doesn't rust it. That's all. Cheers, Devin. Oh, the house doctor. Yeah, right? Oh, my God. Um, Jeff, does fiberglass insulation go bad? No, but it can be a little bit nasty. 1950s to 1970s variety. Woo. Dusty bat worth upgrading to some new or maybe rock wool. Wow. Um, hmm. 1950s insulation has about an R8 value. It started off as a 12, but it's been around for so long. And it doesn't go bad, but it does settle. It does sag a little bit. Okay. And so it leaves gaps at the top of the cavities. So I would definitely suggest upgrading your insulation, but you don't need to go to Rockwell, okay? Like, woo, it's sexy. Listen, you have a 1870s farmhouse, right? Would you consider that to be built with best practice? Why would you put a Lamborghini engine inside a Model A Ford? It's not necessary. You're not getting any return on your investment. 95% of all the homes in North America are not built with best practice. They're built as cheap as freaking possible to shove people in it so they don't die. That's it. That's the business plan. So when you're renovating or remodeling your house, forget all the marketing and sales pitch. Unless you're upgrading every aspect of your home to become part of the top 5% of the homes in the world, you're wasting your money upgrading with best practice because Nothing on your street, nothing else in your house is best practice. Why the hell would you even touch it? Built it as cheap as possible, as nice as you want to live in. That's it. That's the rent for the day, my God. <sighs> By the way, it's not in the wall, exposed areas of a basement, around hot water pipes, etc. 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 Blah blah blah. Um, yeah. Um, if you're insulating in an exposed area then you want to insulate with a blanket because all insulation affects your air quality. Even the next gen insulation from fiberglass, there's still a little bit of an air quality effect. Okay. So you're going to want to cover it. So that means buy insulation blanket, which is insulation with plastic wrap or put insulation on and then wrap it in plastic. Um, but fiberglass is a lot easier to work with in that environment for sure. So go ahead and do that. Chris said Canada's population increased by 285 Blah, 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 the largest increase. We can never build enough homes now. Yes, we can. We can build enough homes. We still have trees. We can always build. It's a wonderful renewable resource, trees. It's amazing how cutting down a tree when I was a kid was, um, was an act of Satan. <laughs> and nowadays, we just learned how to manage forests, and it doesn't bother us anymore. Unbelievable. Cutting down a tree, guess what? It grows back. Wow, surprise, a renewable resource. Ah. Anyway, Tony, Seattle, Washington area. You got an asphalt roof, needs replacing. When and why should someone go metal versus asphalt? Um, the only time you want asphalt is if it's a flat roof. Okay, we don't have a waterproofing system for a flat roof. And flat means we can't divert water. So, if it's flat, water will sit there, so we have to have it waterproof. If it's got a slope, you can you can divert the water, so then you don't have to go with a, with that kind of waterproofing system. You can go with the diversion system. Depending where you live and if you get snow load and ice and all that other stuff, it compounds the, com the, 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 the formula. But Seattle, Washington, you don't really get snow load. So um, if it's not flat, you don't need to go with, uh, with a torch. Um, talk to different roofing people, get different opinions. Cause what you'll find is like, um, if you talk to the flat roof guy, he'll say the flat roof's the best answer. If you talk to the metal roof guy, the metal roof's the best answer. If you talk to an asphalt roof guy, that's the best answer. Um, so you got to combine all that information and then sort through all of the sales pitch to figure out what's best for you. All right. <clears throat> there's no one answer for every situation. So I can't just sit here and say, well, this is the best thing you should do. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't work that way. Uh, all right. Not flat roof. Sorry. Well, then you got options, buddy. All right. You definitely got options. Did you ever work as a roofing contractor? Did I ever work as a roofing contractor? Or as a, as a roofer at all in your 
No, I never did any roofing. Um, I did emergency repairs on roofs, so I know which one's leaking why. <laughs> <laughs> never did roofing for a living. I was never that crazy. That, that's a that's a job, dude. Like, man, roofing is for people that like the sun. Like my son Matt, he can do it. Matt could roof. He loves the heat. He can stand out there, buck naked in the sunshine for forty five hours a day, and it wouldn't bother him at all. Not me. Oh, yeah, you know, and, and like skin that just doesn't care about the sunshine. You don't have to. Some people don't mind being greasy, soaking wet and sweat. Uh, that's not me. I'm I'm too much of a princess for that. Um, is there a trade in the most dire need of labor right now, i.e. where I should really hone my DIY skills so I don't pay out the rear end? That's a really interesting question. Uh, what trade... Would give you the biggest return on investment. Hmm. Huh. Wow. All of them. There's no. <laughs> just just start with where you're competent and then go from there. There's really. Time is more expensive than material right now. So think about what you want to do. You can have an electrician come in and he can rewire a whole house in two days. You can have a plumber come in and he can plumb the whole house in two days. You're going to have a painter come in, and it's going to take them a week to paint the house. You do the math. They're all going to charge 150 bucks an hour. So, that's the great answer right there. Uh, right. I wish I had done my house myself. Yes, yeah, Sandy. Uh, we love Matt, too. We'll tell him hello. Uh, <laughs> for sure. You're going to see glimpses of him in the basement. He's uh, He's helping me. He's part of our production team now, and he still does some manual labor, so... Helps keep me feeling young. So you're going to see him on camera once in a while. He is in the shed too? Yeah. Nice. Lots more Matt coming for all you Matt fans. <laughs> Matty T. Yeah. Oh, oh. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Wow. Look at this. We're coming to the end of the questions. Yeah, we're people need to ask or else I need to prompt you or something. Yeah, right, eh? Paint seems like an easy trade to get into. Yeah. It just doesn't seem insanely hard. No, painting costs you about $40 to get into it. You need a brush and a roller. And if you're going to paint, you might as well pick up drywall. Then you can do two to one. Well, you know, I mean, if you're going to be a painter, yeah. I mean, it's the easiest way to make money right now, right? Because the whole world is selling you on a design, on a concept, right? And everybody wants you to paint your house to change the color because it's going to be so emotionally beneficial. I'm like, well, if you don't know how to paint, that's a hell of an expensive way to get an emotional benefit. I mean, I'd put that money to a therapist if you need that help that bad. I mean, my God. Grossly undercharging for my paint skills. You might be. Yeah, existential paint. Here's the question. When's the last time somebody saw your estimate and they said, no, thanks. That's a little bit out of my league. Because if uh, you're not turning away 50% of your people, time to raise your prices. That's just the that's just the market. Sorry, I know it's harsh. Everybody, there's there's this incredible existential debate with labor. Guys that work for a living with their hands, half of them are like of the mindset of I don't overcharge, right? I want them to be my client forever. I want them to call me the next time, and I'm not a jerk of a human. I don't need to get rich off you. I just want to pay my bills and live my life and charge a you know a decent wage. The other side of that argument is, hey, sometimes people don't call you at all because life sucks. And so when life sucks and no one's calling you, you got to compensate that with when times are great, you need to you need to cash in. You know, so if you've got a uh, volatile marketplace, which nowadays everything is volatile, when people are willing to pay you top dollar, take their top dollar. They're only going to pay it if they got it. And if they got it, it's not going to hurt them. So feel free to go take Oh, all right. All right. Never heard that advice. Price yourself to turn away 50% of, yeah. You know what? If you're, if you're closing hundred percent of your deals, you're way too, way too affordable. <clears throat> if you're turning away 20% and you still can't, you can't take on more work and you're still overrun. You're still too affordable. You're still too affordable. Right. What would you rather work a hundred hours a week for 10 bucks an hour or work 50 hours a week for 20 bucks an hour? 
or work 40 hours a week for $50 an hour. Yep, because when you start working up that curve, there are fewer and fewer people willing to pay, but the ones who are really willing to pay, they don't require as much time and energy from you. So it's a thought. Chris White, cheers to Boston. Do you expect lumber prices to decrease in the near term? No, Chris, I don't. Um, let, let me adjust that by saying this. Maybe another 5 or 10%. But the lumber prices have come down on the supply chain, but the demand is way down on the homeowner right now because of inflation. So they're sitting on old inventory that they bought way overpriced. So they're not lowering the prices until they clear it all out. But yes, lumber is actually cheaper on the open market than what you see at the retail store. So it should go down a little bit more, but it's going to take time. And until people start buying the lumber, get rid of the old inventory that they over over purchased on, then they're not going to put the new stuff on the shelf with the new price. So we might it it might be into the new year before we see lumber really come down. Wouldn't be a big surprise. It's unfortunate, but yeah, don't be surprised if it's another three months. All right. I mean, as long as the news is scaring the hell out of everybody with ten percent inflation, no, you know, people don't have an appetite to go and invest in renovations. But. Uh, who knows? This might actually be one of the best times to take a look at doing a project, especially if you need trades, because a lot of people are being scared away right now. So good time to wiggle in. <laughs> Call up the electrician and say, hey, by the way, how, what's, your, what's, your, uh, what's, your, what's your fall looking like? You got some space there for me? You know, and if they start to sweat because they're not getting booked as much, maybe the prices will start coming down, too. All righty. Um, yeah. There you go. All right. Well, guys. Listen, it's 20 to 7. Um, I'm ready to call it. I don't need to be here for another 20 minutes just for the hell of it. I know it's romantic. We usually do a two-hour show, but uh, if, if we're all busy and we don't have any questions, I'm going to head out. Um, Devin says, your neighbor down here in Toronto. Last question, my customer, custom shower niche. I'm adding a split in the middle. Yep, yeah, horizontal, got it, two shelves. What would you recommend to hold the middle tile? Silicone with a slight tilt? Nah. No, 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 no. The best thing you can do is contact Schluter, um, your local Schluter dealer. They make pre-made shelves that have drainage designs cut into them with a CNC machine. And you just slide it right into the grout line of the tile. All right? Done. And now if you bought one of those Schluter boxes and they've got that thick piece and you got to tile it all up, tile it all up and make sure each shelf has got a one-degree slope. That's all. Put those in last. Tile everything, put those in last, and silicone the edges. You'll be fine. All right. Well, there we go. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, the dad responses. Oh, gotta love it. Well, guys, thanks. Listen, uh, it's been it's been a blast. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, hopefully, we help some people out, and we will see you in the next live show. And we will be in touch with you in community posts to discuss what that might look like and when that might look like, and all that kind of good stuff. So, cheers till next time, and I will see you in a few weeks. Hmm.